from around the globe, it's theCUBE. Covering HPE Discover Virtual Experience. Brought to you by HPE. Hi everybody, you're watching theCUBE. And this is Dave Vellante and our continuous coverage of the Discover 2020 Virtual Experience, HPE's virtual event. The Cube is here, the Cube Virtual. We're really excited, we got a great session here. We're going to dig deep into machine intelligence and artificial intelligence. Dr. Artie Garg is here. She's the head of advanced AI solutions and technologies at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And she's joined by Dr. Soren Kieran, who's the vice president of AI strategy and solutions group at HPE. Folks, great to see you. Welcome to theCUBE. Hi. Hi, nice to be here. Hello. Uh, Dr. Kieran, let's start with you. Maybe talk a little bit about your, your role. You've had a variety of roles. Um, and, and maybe where, what you, what's your current uh, situation at HPE? Um, hello, hi. So um, currently at HP, I'm, uh, I'm uh, driving um, the Artificial Intelligence Strategy and Solution Group who uh, is currently looking at how do we bring solutions across the HP portfolio, looking at uh, every business unit, but also on the various geos. And at the same time, the team is responsible for uh, building the strategy around, around AI for the, entire, uh, for the entire company. We're working closely with uh, uh, the field, we're working uh, closely with uh, the teams that are facing the customers every day, and we're also working very, very closely with uh, the various groups in order to make sure that whatever we build, holds water for the entire company. Okay, uh, Dr. Dr. Garg, maybe you could share with us your focus these days. Yeah, sure. So I'm also part of the AI strategy and solutions team under Soren as our new um, vice president in that role. And what I'm focused on is really trying to understand what are some of the emerging technologies, whether those be things like new processor architectures or advanced software technologies that could really enhance what we can offer to our customers in terms of AI and exploring what makes sense and how do we bring them to our customers? What are the right ways to package them into solutions? Okay, so, so everybody's talking about how digital transformation has been accelerated. If you're not digital, you can't transact business. Uh, AI infused into every application and now people are, are, are realizing hey, we can't solve all of the world, world's problems with labor. Uh, what are you seeing just in terms of AI being accelerated in, throughout the portfolio and your customers? So uh, that's, uh, that's a very good idea because we've been talking about uh, digital, uh, digital transformation for some time now. And I believe most of our customers believed initially that the one thing that they have is time. So thinking that, oh yes, I'm going to somehow at one point apply AI, and somehow at one point I'm going to uh, figure out how to build a data strategy or how to use AI in my different line of businesses. What happened in the, with, uh, with COVID-19 and in this area is that we lost one thing, time. So what we've discussed, what, what we've seen our customers is the idea of, of accelerating uh, their data strategy, accelerating moving from, uh, um, uh, uh, let's say an environment where they, they were compute centric models to a data centric models, trying to understand how do they capture data? How do they accelerate? How do they accelerate the adoption of AI within the various business um, business units? Why? Because they, they understand that currently the, the way they are actually going to do business changed completely. They need to understand how to adapt the new business models. They need to understand how to look for value pools where there are none as well. So most of our customers today, while initially they spend a lot of time in an, a never ending POC trying to investigate where do they want to go, Currently today, they want to accelerate um, uh, uh, the application of AI models, the, the build of data strategies, how then they use all of this data, how do they capture the data to make sure that they, then they look at new business models, models, new value pools, new customer experience and so on and so forth. So what we've, what we've seen in the past, let's say three to six months is that we lost time, but the shift towards, uh, towards an adoption of, uh, of analytics, AI and data strategies accelerated a lot, simply because customers realize that they need to get ahead of the game. So, uh, Dr. Garg, I wonder if you could talk about how HPE is utilizing machine intelligence, you know, during this pandemic, uh, maybe helping some of your customers, you know, get ahead of it or at least try to track it. How are you applying AI in this context? So, you know, I think that um, as Soren sort of spoke to, one of the things with adopting AI is it's very transformational for a business. So it, 
changes how you do things. It, you need to actually adopt new processes to take advantage of it. So what I would say is right now, we're hearing from customers who recognize that the context in which they are doing their work is completely different. And they're exploring how AI can help them really meet the challenges of those contexts. So one example might be, you know, how can AI and computer vision be coupled together in a way that makes it easier to reopen stores or ensure that people are distancing appropriately in factories. So I would say that it's the beginning of these conversations as, um, as customers, as businesses try to figure out how do we operate in the new reality that we have. And, um, and I, you know, I think it's a pretty exciting time. And I think just to the point that Soren just made, there's a lot of openness to new technologies that there wasn't before because there's this willingness to change the, the business processes to really take advantage of the new technologies. Okay, so Dr. Karen, I probably should have started here, but, but help us understand HPE's overall strategy with regard to AI. We certainly know that you're using AI to you know, improve uh, IT, uh, the info site, you know, product and capability via, you know, the nimble acquisition, et cetera, and bringing that across the portfolio. But what's the strategy uh, for HPE? So, um, yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a good, that's a great question. So, uh, you obviously, uh, you started with a couple of our acquisition in the past, which was obviously nimble. And then, um, we, we talked a lot about, uh, our, uh, efforts to, to bring InfoSight across the portfolio, but currently in the past couple of, um, couple of months, let's say. Uh, uh, close to a year, we've been announcing a lot of other acquisitions and we've been talking about Blue Data and we've been talking about Skytel, we've been talking about Cray and so on and so forth. And uh, now the, what, we, what we are doing at HP is to bring all of this IP together into one place and try to, um, to, uh, to help our customers within their AI journey. How? If you're looking at what, uh, what for example, we, uh, what did we actually get when we acquired we car Cray, was not only the HPC part, but we also contain, or we also did, uh, we, we also acquired, and we also have a lot of software and a lot of IP around optimization and so on and so forth. Also, within our own labs, we've been investigating AI around, uh, like, for example, swarm learning or uh, accelerators or uh, um, a, a lot of other activities. So, right now, what we are trying to, to help our customers with is to understand how do they leap, how do they leap from the production state in, from the POC state in the production state. So if we're looking at what we're trying to do is we're trying to accelerate their adoption of AI. So simply starting from, the, from, from an optimized platform infrastructure up to the solutions they are actually going to, uh, to apply or to use to solve their business problems and wrapping all of that around with, uh, with, uh, with services, either consumed on-prem, as a service and so on. So practically what we want to do is we want to help our customers optimize, orchestrate and operationalize AI. Because the problem of our customers is not to start in OPOC. The problem is how do I then take everything that I've been developing or working on and then put that um, in production at the edge, right? And then keep it maintaining in production in order to, to, uh, to, uh, to get insights and then actually take actions that, uh, that are helping the enterprise. So basically we want to, we want to be data-driven, asset in cloud enabled, and we want to help our customers move from POC into production. Artie, you work with obviously a lot of you know, data folks, companies are data-driven, data scientists, you, you are hands-on practitioners in this regard. One of the challenges that I hear a lot from customers is you're trying to operationalize AI, put AI in, into production. They, they have you know, data in silos, they spend all their time you know, munging data. You guys have, have made a number of acquisitions, you know, not the least of which is Cray, obviously MapR from you know, data specialist, uh, uh, my friend, my Kumar's company, Blue Data. So, what do you see as HP's role in terms of helping companies operationalize AI? So, I, I think that a big part of operationalizing AI, moving away from the POC to really integrate um, AI into the business processes you have and also the sort of pre-existing IT infrastructure you talked about, you might already have siloed data. That's sort of something we know very well at HPE. We understand a lot of the IT that um, enterprises already have, the incumbent IT and those systems. And we also understand how to put together systems and integrated systems that include a lot of different types of computing infrastructure. So whether that be different types of servers and different types of storage, 
we have the ability to bring all of that together. And then we also have the software that allows you to talk to all of these different components and build applications that can be deployed in the real world in a way that's easy to maintain and, um, and scale and grow as your AI applications will almost invariably get more complex, involve more outputs, involve more inputs. And so one of the important things as customers try to operationalize AI is think is knowing that it's not just solving the problem you're currently solving. It's not just operationalizing the solution you have today. It's ensuring that you can continue to operationalize new things or additional capabilities in the future. I, I want to talk a little bit about AI for good. You know, everybody talks about AI taking away jobs, but but you know it, it, the reality is is when you look at the productivity data, for instance, in the United States and, and Europe, <laughs> it's declining, and it has for the last you know for several decades. Um, and so I guess my point is that we're not going to be able to solve some of the the world problems in the coming decades without machine intelligence. Um, I mean, you think about healthcare, you think about feeding populations. Uh, you think about obviously you know things like pandemics, climate change, energy alternatives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know productivity is coming down. Machines are a potential you know opportunity. So there's an automation imperative. And, and do you feel, uh, Dr. Kieran, that people have, are sort of beyond that machines replacing humans issue? Is that still a, a, an item, or has the pandemic sort of changed that? So um, I believe it is uh, so. It used to be an, it used to be a very big item, you're right. And every time I was, uh, we were uh, uh, speaking at the conference, and every time you're actually looking at the features of AI, right? Two scenarios are coming into place, right? The first one where uh, machines are here to actually, uh, you know, uh, take our work, and then the second one is, you know, even a, a darker version where, you know, Terminator is coming and so on and so forth, right? So basically, these are the two, you know, is the lesser evil and the and, and the greater evil and so on and so forth. So. Uh, and we di we still see that recurrent theme going coming over and over again. And I believe that 2019 was the year of reckoning where people are trying to realize that not only we can actually create responsible AI, but we can actually create you know um, uh, an AI that is trustworthy, an AI with, that that is uh, uh, that is fair and so on and so forth. And that we also understood in 2019 it was highly debated everywhere which part of our jobs are going to be replaced, like the part that are mundane uh, that can actually be easily automated and so on. So with the COVID-19, what happened is that uh, people are starting to look at AI differently. Why? Because people are starting to look at data differently and looking at data differently, how do I actually create this, this core of data which is uh, trusted, secure and so on and so forth. And they are trying to understand that if the data is trusted and secure, somehow AI will be trusted and secure as well. Now, if I actually shift it forward, as you said, and then I try to understand, for example, on the manufacturing floor, how do I add more machines? Or how do I replace uh, humans with machines simply because, you know, um, I need to make sure, make sure that I, I'm, I'm able to stay in production and so on and so forth. From that perspective, I don't believe that the view of, the, of, how, of how people are actually looking at AI from the, from the job market perspective changed a lot. The view that actually changed is how AI is helping us uh, better certain crises, how AI is helping us, for example, in healthcare. But the idea of AI actually taking part of the jobs or automating part of the jobs, we are not actually past yet. Even if 2018 and um, even more so in 2019, it was the year also where, where actually AI through automation uh, uh, the, uh, uh, replaced a number of jobs. But at the same time, it was, as I was saying, the first year where AI created more jobs because once you're displacing in one point in in one place, you're actually creating uh, creating more work, uh, more uh, more opportunities in other places as well. So, uh, but still, I don't believe the the feeling changed. But uh, we realize that AI is a lot more valuable and it can actually help us through uh, our some of our dark, uh, uh, darkest hours, but also allow us get be be better and faster insights as well. Well, machines have always replaced you know humans, and now for the first time in history, it's doing so in a, in a really cognitive functions in a, in a big way. But I want to ask you guys, I'll start with Dr. Dart, a series of questions that I think underscore the impact of AI and the central role that it plays in, in companies' digital transformations. We talk about that a lot, but, but the questions that I'm going to ask you, I think, will, will hit home just in terms of some hardcore examples. And if you have others, I, I'd love to hear them. But, but I'm going to start with, with uh, Artie. So 
when do you think doctor or machines will be able to make better diagnoses of than than doctors? Are we actually there today already? So I think it depends a little bit on how you define that. And I'm just going to preface this by saying both of my parents are physicians. So I have a little bit of bias in this space. But I think that, um, you know, humans can bring creativity and a certain type of intelligence that it's not clear to me we even know how to model with the computer. And so diagnoses have sometimes two components. One is recognizing patterns and being able to say, you know, this, I'm, I'm going to diagnose this disease that I've seen before. I think that we are getting to the place where there are, you know, there are certain examples. Um, it's just starting to happen where you might be able to take, you know, if it's the data that you need to make a diagnosis is well understood, a machine may able be able to sort of recognize those subtle patterns better. But, but there's another component of doing diagnoses is when it's not obvious what you're looking for. You're trying to figure out what is the actual sort of set of diseases I might be looking at. And I think that's where we don't really know how to model those that type of inspiration and creativity that humans still bring to things that they do, including medical diagnoses. Okay, so D Dr. Kieran, my next question is, when do you think that owning and driving uh, your own vehicle will become uh, uh, largely obsolete. <laughs> so, um, uh, well, uh, I believe, you know, my son is uh, six year old now, and um, I believe, you know, I'm working with a lot of companies to make sure that he will not get his driving license when he's 18, right? So, um, uh, so uh, uh, depending who you're asking and depending the level of autonomy that you're looking at, but you just mentioned level five, most likely, so uh, there are a lot of uh, dates out there. So some people actually say 2030. I believe that uh, my son in uh, most of the cities in US, but also most of the cities in Europe, by the time he's 18 in let's say um, uh, 2035, he'll have, uh, I'll try to make sure that uh, I'm working with the right companies not to allow him to get a driving license. Okay, I'll, my next question is for, maybe both of you can answer. Do you think that traditional banks will lose control of, of the payment system? So that's an interesting question because I think it, it's broader than an AI question, right? I think mm -hmm. that it goes into some other emerging technologies, including distributed ledgers and sort of the more secure forms of blockchain. That's a, I think that's a challenging question to my mind because it's bigger than the technology. It's got economic and policy implications that I'm not sure I can answer. <laughs> Well, that, no, that's a great answer because I, I agree with you, Artie. I think that that governments and banks mm -hmm. have, you know, a partnership in a, and it's, it's an important part partnership for social stability. But uh, you know, similar, you know, we've seen now, uh, Dr. Kieran, in retail. You know, obviously, the COVID nineteen has affected retail in a major, major way, especially physical retail. Do you think the, you know, large retail stores are going to go away. I mean, we've seen many in, in chapter 11, you know, to Artie's point, what, what, how much of that is, you know, machine intelligence versus just social change versus some digital transformation. It's an interesting question, isn't it? So I think most of the, um, right now, uh, the retailers are here to stay for the next, uh, I guess, for the next couple of years, but moving forward, I think their, their, um, capacity of adapting to, to stores like to walk-in stores or to stores where basically you just go in and there are uh, no shop assistants and you just you don't even you, do, you don't even need a credit card to pay you're actually being able to pay either with uh, your face or with your phone or with your small chip and so on and so forth so I, I believe currently in the next couple of years obviously they are here to stay moving forward and looking at uh, artificial intelligence or uh, or robotics applied everywhere in the store and so on and so forth most likely their capacity of adapting to the new normal which is placing AI everywhere and optimizing the, the, the working through, uh, predicting uh, when and how to, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to guide the customers to the, to, to the shop and so on and so forth would allow them to actually survive. I don't believe that everything is actually going to be done online, especially from the retailer perspective. Most of the, we, we've seen a big shift with COVID-19, but uh, what I was reading uh, the other day, especially you know, in France, that the, 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 the country has opened again, We've seen a very quick pickup in the in, in the retailers of people that actually visiting the stores as well. So um, uh, it's going to be some very interesting five to ten years. 
and then most of the companies that have uh, uh, adapted to the digital transformation and to the new normal, I think they are here to stay. Some of them obviously are going to, uh, uh, to step aside. I mean, I think it's an interesting question too and that, you, that you're really sort of triggering in my mind uh, is, is when you think about the framework for how companies are gonna come back and come out of this, it, you know, it's, it's not just, you know, digital, well, that's a big piece of it, like how digital the business is, you know, can they physically distance? I mean, I don't know how sports <laughs> arenas are going to be able to physically distance. That's going to be interesting to see. How essential is the business? And if you think about the different industries, it it really is is quite different across those industries. And obviously, digital plays a big factor there. But maybe we can end on, on that. Your your final thoughts, and maybe any other other things you'd like to share with our audience. So, I, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting anytime you talk about adopting a new technology and right now we're happening to see this sort of huge uptick in AI adoption happening right at the same time that this is sort of massive shift in how we live our live our lives is happening and sort of an acceptance i think that um you can't just go back to the way things were because you, you know as you mentioned there'll probably be continued sort of desire to maintain social distancing i think that it's going to force us to sort of rethink you know why we do things the way we do now a lot you know the retail environment that we have the transportation solutions that we have, they were adapted, you know, in many cases, you know, in a very different context in terms of, you know, what people need to do on a day-to-day -day basis within their life. And then what were the sort of state of tech art technologies available? We're sort of being thrust and forced to reckon with like, what is it I really need to do to live my life? And then what are the technologies I have available to me to answer that? And I think, you know, it's, it's really difficult to predict right now what people will think is important about a retail experience. I wouldn't be surprised if you start to find in-person retail actually be much less, you know, technologically aided and much more about having the ability to talk to a human being and get their opinion and, you know, maybe the tactile sense of being able to, like, you know, touch new clothes or whatever it is. And so it, it's really difficult, I think, right now to predict what things are going to look like maybe even a year or two from now from that perspective i think that what i feel fairly confident is is that people are really starting to understand and engage with new technologies and they are going to be really open to thinking about what those new technologies enable them to do in this sort of new way of living that we're going to probably be entering pretty soon excellent all right soren bring us home we'll give you the last word on this topic no, so uh, I wanted to um, to uh, I, I agree with I, I, I agree with Artie because what these three months of uh, staying at home and of busy shutting down allowed us to do was uh, to actually have a very big reset. So we let's say a great reset, where basically we realized that all the things we've taken from granted, like our uh, our uh, uh, freedom of move, our of movement, our um, technology, our interactions with each other, and then also for suddenly we realized that everything needs to change. And the only one thing that we actually kept doing is uh, interacting with each other remotely, inter uh, interacting with each other uh, with, um, uh, with, uh, with our peers in the house and so on and so forth. But the one thing that stayed was generating data. And uh, uh, data was here to stay because we, we actually leave trails of data everywhere we go. We, we leave trails of data when we, when we put our watch on, where we're actually playing with our phone, where we consume digital and so on and so forth. So, what these three months reinforced for me personally, but also for some of our customers, was that the data is here to stay. And even if the world shut down for three months, we did not generate less data. Data was there on the contrary, in some cases, more data. So the data is the main enabler for the new normal that is going to pick up. And, and the data will actually allow us to understand how to increase customer experience in the new normal, most likely using AI. How, as I was saying at the beginning, how do I actually operate new business models? How do I find, how, who do I partner with? How do I actually go to market together? How do I make uh, uh, collaborations more, uh, more uh, 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 secure and so on and so forth? And finally, wh where do I actually find new value pools? For example, how do I actually still enjoy for, uh, uh, having a beer in a pub, right? Because suddenly during the COVID-19, that was not possible. 
I have a very uh, nice place uh, around the corner that is actually shipping stuff. I'm not talking about beer here, but in general, I mean, so the experience is different. The pools of data uh, uh, that uh, the pools from where we are actually uh, getting values are different as well. So data is here to stay, and the AI definitely is going to be accelerated because it needs to use data to allow us to uh, to adapt to the new normal in the digital transformation. Yeah, a lot of unknowns, but but certainly machines and data are going to play a big role in this uh, coming decade. I want to thank Dr. Artigard and Dr. Soren Kieran for coming on the Cube. It was great to have you. Thank you for a wonderful conversation. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. All right, and thank you for watching, everybody. This is Dave Vellante for the Cube and the HPE 2020 virtual experience. We'll be right back right after this short break. Mm -hmm.